Oh, let me just give, let's do a quick little bit of introduction. So my name is Ron Legere. This is only my second book club I've been involved in. And so uh, facilitating it is kind of a leap of uh, faith on my part, but I'm hoping you guys are all going to be able to jump in and help out and make, uh, make it happen. So again, the facilitator, the main job of the facilitator is just to kind of bring the group together and but the people leading each meeting is, have you, have you, have you oh, let me get that, man. So, and the person leading each meeting is a different person every week. So that's how it basically works. Um, have you guys been involved in these book clubs before? Have some experience with them? No, it's my first time. Robert? I have. I okay, have cool. not, actually. No worries. Okay. Well, then we'll all, all be relatively new. So on the Slack channel itself, you'll see, oops, let me just close that. Look at me. On the Slack channel itself, uh, maybe I can bring this up. Hold on a minute. Oh, Rachel, are you there? Yes, I'm sorry. I am. No, no worries. Did you have an update? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of stuff's <laughs> going on here. <laughs> but okay, so quick uh, thing: we just uh, John the geek, the guy that runs this whole thing, would wondered if we could move to an hour earlier, or and everybody else Absolutely. so far is good with that. Yeah. Okay, I'll let him know. Not for, for so starting next week, we'll start at one hour early. I better make a note of that myself. I will forget. And I was just explaining to them that this is my first uh, time facilitating only the second uh, book club I've been involved in. Sounds good. Also, I've uh, signed up for a lot of groups, but I. I, uh, for whatever reason, I've had a hard time actually getting to the you know, some kind of work related thing that get in the way. So, no, I hear that. I do hear that. That does happen quite a bit, for sure, for me as well. Now, let's see. I want to find. So, if you go, one of the first things. So, if, uh, Rachel, have you been involved in book clubs? This is before? my very first. I'm very inexperienced with this. Okay. Okay, well, then we'll all learn together. This is only my second one and my first time. Right. But, the, but the most important thing is that this is really just like a book club. Right? Everybody just brings to the table whatever they can um, review, you know, read the book, talk about the book. There's usually some charts or not charts, but like a markdown or markdown document that kind of leads the discussion. I'm going to use that today. Um, it's just and I didn't even create this. I made this some minor edits to it, but it's really the cohort one guy's notes. So sure. um, I, I, you can though you can edit them, make them your own. As, as much as you want to when it's your turn to do that. Um, so if, if you go, hold on, let me just do the share screen thingy. I will share this one right here, okay. So now you should be able to see, no, not yet. You should be able to see my um, Slack window there. Yep. Yeah. So up here at the top, there's the book, there's links for things, the book, the shared notes, which is what I'll be using. Actually, I have used my own local copy because I did make a couple minor edits that typos, but I'll, and then I'll push those later to the repository later. Um, most important thing is this sign up thing. So we're in cohort. Well, wait a minute, that's the wrong book club. <laughs> Hello, there we go, phase rules. Sorry, wrong book club. <laughs> um, that's the other book club. <laughs> so there's the book, there's the shared notes and the sign up. So we're in cohort two. So what you want to do is try to um, try to find um, you know, look at, you can sign up for any, you don't have to have any experience at all. You don't have to have any, you know, you just we're all reading the book together. We're all learning this together. So hopefully somebody can volunteer to, you know, you know, pick whatever times you might think you'd be able to, to prepare for that week and feel free to sign up as far advanced as you want to, or, or not in advance, whatever you want to do. But that's where you do it. Just put your name in there. It's editable. You just go in there and you just put your na own name in there. Um, so if anybody right away feels like, hey, I want to jump in there and lead week two, uh, feel free to do that. Otherwise, it's probably so, be me doing it. <laughs> I'm still trying to find what we're, uh, what we're, so where are we? Okay, so this is, this, where is it? Okay. How are you getting to that? So oh, it's in the, oh, sure. Okay, yeah, see the top here, the pinned, the pinned items. There's, there's books there and this, oh, sorry. The signups is what I was actually looking at. Signups cohort two that thing. You click that, you'll get to that spreadsheet, that Google spreadsheet that I had up. And this GitHub repo, by the way, is where the source for the shared notes are, where you can fork that. And there's some instructions in there how to do that, how to uh, using R commands, actually, there's some R helper commands to help you, you know, 
set up a your own copy of the notes you can edit, edit and push up and then john the geek i guess he's the keeper of that and he'll decide he'll help you pull a little, he'll anyway he's the guy to ask any questions too about any of that type of level stuff like oh my pull request didn't work or whatever he's the one that answers those and he's the one that proves the pull request for bring the notes in don't i know that sounds super complicated a little bit but it's not really it's actually super easy um i mean i could do it so hey <laughs> i feel like anyone could be able to do it <laughs> so that's kind of the the overall structure of the book club so we'll meet here every week we'll, we'll everybody should read the chapter beforehand or the, do the exercises or whatever the right thing is um we in this schedule we don't have we're not beholden to this schedule necessarily this is our book club so if we're like oh we need another week on chapter two because we, i want to you know so somebody should we didn't get through the whole thing whatever we can just we can push things down it's no problem right now this is pretty aggressive doing a chapter a week i think but um and i only know this from my experience with one other book club because that's what they did there so but clearly it's our book club we do what we want on it with that being said let me get on to the material itself where did i put the thing yes so now what you should see is my version of the the notes for the club Oh, quick, one more quick, uh, now we do have to end right at 11 today because of this, that's why we had to move earlier because it turns out there was a snafu and he's like, oh, I did this wrong. It's gonna be too tight against the advanced R book club, which many of you may have signed up for by mistake like I did because it's like, if you go to the link, it automatically goes to advanced R for some reason. But anyway, I'm not ready for advanced R. The, um, what was I about to say? I, oh, uh, so just my experience on this kind of stuff. I'm a physicist by training, I'm actually now you know, sabbatical, not doing anything. But uh, my, my interest in this is more for doing my own consulting work, doing my own data science, data analysis, consulting work. So I'm, I have some experience with Bayesian analysis before, and I've been exposed to it. I've gone through some other books and on this, but I just want to get more refreshed with it and, and maybe get a different perspective on it. It's my purpose for doing this thing. Also, I've never, you know, I'm not very good with R, I'll just be honest with you. I'm not an R person, I'm more of a Python person. So I'm kind of debating on whether I want to try to do these exercises in R or do my Python. I'll have to wait and see. But um, so, it's, so let's go around. So Robert, what is your uh, background in the data science Bayesian or whatever? Yeah. So I'm a which I call it. I I was uh, I mean I graduated undergrad a couple of years ago from GW as a poli sci major, uh, minor in stats. Uh, right now I just work as a data analyst at a small tech company out in uh, DC. Um, I think I, I mean I took a I took a Bayesian class in undergrad and I enjoyed it so um, I just kind of wanted to brush it up uh, a bit more because I, I didn't think I really got like uh, too too deep into it and I figured like hey why not why not just join a book club and see what happens <laughs> absolutely I mean I think that these book clubs are great even if you, you'd be surprised at the things you thought you knew but you when somebody else asks a question about it, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I didn't understand that as well as I thought, because that's a good question, which I don't know the answer for. No, yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes, <laughs> especially like self-learning can sometimes, you know, just be tough, right? Because then you're like doing work, you have other stuff outside of work, and you're like trying to manage everything. So it could sometimes be like hard just doing it by yourself. So I figured why not just yeah. go to a community of like like-minded kind people. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Uh, Rachel? What about you? What's your oh, background sure. in? Uh... Oh, the background's very limited. I don't have any background at all. Very, very new. <laughs> so I'm a brand new master's student. Um, just moved down to Kansas in January and found out through the data I'll be working with, I'll have to do something Bayesian related. What that means, awesome. I don't even know. Well, so I'm, I'm here to learn. Oh, perfect. Well, this, this book is perfect for that. It really is. I mean, it takes it right from the very beginning. So that's good. What's your master's you're working on? My master's is in the natural college of natural resources, but we're looking at bird, grassland bird declines. We'll be working with BBS. Oh, wow. Data. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. And Ryan. Yeah, I uh, have a kind of a long background in doing analysis back to the nineties, but, uh, um, you know, and back then, obviously the frequentists pretty much ruled Bayesian these, uh, weirdos that you know, nobody talked to, but now obviously that's changed quite a bit in the last uh, 20 years or so. So I just feel like it's incumbent on me to learn more about this. And I, I don't have much of a background. Um, I, I currently work as a um, real world evidence um, scientist. 
Atlantis or uh, Oracle. So, I'm, oh wow! Yeah. So, um, yeah, I uh, I'm, I'm become increasingly harder as the years gone on to ignore <laughs> this movement. So it's a good time, I think, for everybody to um, learn more. By the way, I signed. I can do next next week. So that's okay. Oh, know. perfect! Great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, go ahead and put your name right in there. Yeah, I, I did. Okay, great. So let's just dive right in. We only got half an hour left, so we'll, I may go a little fast. So feel free to jump in. I mean, I assume that you guys have all read the chapter. It's basically just an introductory chapter of the book, and it's meant to just give you a flavor for what's coming up ahead. So. Uh, the objectives were for the these are learning objectives they list here are basically for the uh, of this chapter alone is kind of just learning to think like a Bayesian whatever that particularly might mean um, explore the foundations of Bayesian data analysis and how they contrast with frequentists and then learn a little bit about this history like Ryan was referring to like all well, things have changed recently and part of that of course we know is from the advent of easy computing power right uh, so that was that oops now this just gives a kind of over now remember this part of the chapter they just kind of give an overview of what the bayesian picture what the bayesian viewpoint is it's the viewpoint of really considering your existing prior information then folding in your data and then developing a posterior um uh picture of what's happening in very rough terms right so and this is they claim and it's i think it's true this is kind of how people actually really do approach the world right you have a certain set of beliefs you have a certain idea of how how things are, and then you get some new data and you adjust it appropriately. Um, like, for example, in that quiz, they give that example from uh, Parks and Rec, right? With the, about the chocolate milk, remember that? Did you guys do the, did everybody do the quiz? Yeah. I did not actually, sorry. So I actually scored pretty highly on that. I got an 11 on the quiz. Uh, I wasn't too surprised by that because I've, I've been thinking in a kind of Bayesian way for a long time, not just from a a data analysis point of view, more from like a science point of view, it's kind of the the logic of science, as it were, right? How the only it's infer, it's a infer, how to do inference in a mathematical way, right? Anybody else want to volunteer their quiz scores and what they? Think yeah, doing this? I think I got an eight, uh, which is not. I guess that's not totally shocking. Okay. It's definitely not. I think it's partly because of how like it's, like I minor in stats in undergrad, so like I think a lot of it was just focused right on like the frequentists viewpoint right and i do agree yeah. with what even what the first chapter was saying um and like you also summarize as well that we tend to think in a more bayesian way right like um we like look at the world we then like kind of update our beliefs on you know external information um and obviously in a very rough sense but yeah i wasn't like particularly that shocked uh, hoping to be a bit more on the bayesian side i just think it's a a better framework for you know some sort of a lot more like decision, especially like in the business world. But yeah. <laughs> Did you do the quiz, Rachel? Yeah, I fell right in the middle. To be honest, I don't really okay. know what that means. Yeah. Well, I mean, you take kind of a more balanced approach, and I think that's that's good. I think that's probably the right approach. I think I'm maybe too far leading toward the base. I think uh, there's. I mean, to my view, there's really nothing wrong. I mean, the book kind of makes it sound like. Kind of builds a kind of a straw man argument against the frequentist approach, right? I mean, I think the next slide is about. Um, so the, this is just about the difference between, you know, Bayesian. You're talking about the relative. So this is having to do with the, this is interesting to me. This the, this part of the book talks about the interpretations of probability, right? So the Bayesians interpret probability as the relative plausibility, which allows them to talk about, oh, that's the probability is going to rain today, or what's the probability that um, the next person that walks through my door is Bob or whatever one time events that you can't really repeat. Um, whereas frequentist philosophy defines probability as being this relative long run frequency. I think all that is completely not important to me. I mean, nobody really talks, nobody really thinks, I think, no practitioners really think, oh, what's your definition of probability? My definition of probability, I just use the axiomatic Kolmogov axioms or whatever, <laughs> who cares? Right? <laughs> I think you use whatever definition is kind of handy at the time, maybe what depends on the situation in real life. So. Um, I like this quote from this book called Statistical Rethinking, which is another book about Bayesian analysis. There's another book called that was doing statistical rethinking, but now uh, John the Geek doesn't like doing any books that aren't available free online. So he's kind of discontinuing that one. And this is meant to replace that in some ways, right? But 
he has a, there's a great quote. He says, this is all the Bayesian data analysis is, is just a logical procedure for processing information. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just a very logical procedure. You start with a model, a probability model, and you try to, you, you figure out which parameters are most likely given the data you have essentially, right? And the distribution of those parameters as well. So it's, it's not like, it doesn't really require a radical shift in your worldview to apply this kind of tools in my view. So that's my my uh, soapbox there. What do you want to call it? Uh, editorializing on it, but that's what that part of the book was about. Uh, this Bayesian balancing act thing goes back to the quiz question about uh, if you didn't do the quiz, you may not know this, but there's a uh, the question in the book for the quiz was oh there's uh, well it's right here. So there's a psychic that claims he can predict the outcome of a coin flip, right? And he does so ten times in a row, flips a coin every time he's able to predict heads, tails, whatever it is. Uh, and then a different experiment is this woman, Kavya, claims she can distinguish between natural and artificial sweeteners, and she also succeeds 10 out of 10. And the claim is that the Bayesian would use the prior information. Well, I think it's not hard to believe that someone could tell the difference between a natural and artificial sweetener. So this 10 out of 10 is very convincing for me. She definitely can do it. Whereas for also for the Bayesian, the, the Zofu, you'd be like, well, all right, so you got 10 out of 10. He must have just got lucky, right? I mean, there's no, he's not a psychic. I really have a very low prior belief in psychics, so there's no way that he's a psychic. That was kind of the point of that. Um, in other words, the idea of the, the frequentist, though, would say, oh, uh, the frequentist would say, oh, it's 10 out of 10. The null hypothesis is, you know, rejected to this level. In both cases, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I think that's, there's some value to that, right? From a Bayesian point of view, outrageous claims require outrageous evidence, right? <laughs> if somebody's making some crazy claim, whatever it is, you know, you require some very solid evidence to back that up, not just 10 trials. But I think there's another interesting aspect of this experiment, and that is, I think, that, in other words, I think the frequentist would not necessarily say, oh, he's definitely a psychic. I think just because you reject the null hypothesis doesn't mean you automatically accept the hypothesis that he's a psychic. Let's suppose he flipped a coin 100 times and got correctly judged it, right? Um, you wouldn't then say, well, okay, I guess that's, I mean, the probability of predicting 100 coin tosses is so small, I have to reject the null hypothesis. But that doesn't mean I can't accept some other hypothesis, like, He's cheating or something. And that, that's what I meant earlier when I said I thought this is a little bit of a straw man argument. A frequentist is not going to be like, oh, blindly go, yep, okay, I'm convinced, you know, of this. Although maybe it's a little cautionary tale because I think sometimes you do see things in the literature that are kind of like that, right? They like reject the null hypothesis. They say, oh, then my idea is, my hypothesis is correct. It's like, well, no, wait a minute. There's other explanations for your data that you're not considering, right? And a neat thing I think in Bayesian approach is that it actually a lot of that comes out automatically you almost have to think about these questions about other hypotheses which is kind of nice um so that's uh that's that section any questions about this or any observations just jump in like this is not my thing this is our thing so just you know i'm rambling sometimes just interrupt me jump in uh raise your hand whatever it is hack into my computer turn it off anything you might be <laughs> just kidding <laughs> don't do that uh so the last section of this thinking like a Bayesian thing is just gives this example. And this is like the classic example for Bayesian, uh, for discussing Bayesian analysis. Like, you know, do you have a disease or you don't have a disease? And the, the stats are here in the middle of the slide. So I keep moving this around. It's probably causing problems. The stats are here in the middle. And the basic idea is that, okay, so if you, if you test, the question is, if you test positive, what's the probability that you have the disease? It's kind of a Bayesian way of looking at it, right? Because you, I want to know what's the posterior probability that I have disease given this test result, right? The prior probability was pretty small. Uh, four out of 96 people, or four out of 100 people have the disease, but I tested positive, right? However, because the test is not perfect, nine people out of that 100 also would test positive and not have the disease. So you can say, okay, my probability of having disease is three divided by 12. It's the number of people that test positive that have the disease divided by the total number of people that test positive. It's not, of those 12 people that test positive, only three of them uh, have a disease. And that's the correct way to think about it. And this is not restrict, I mean, the frequentists don't think of it a different way either, by the way. They, they can do the same kind of, you know, counting. It's not really have anything to do with your definition of probabilities. It's just counting, right? But, uh, Often, though, frequentists that will can speak us about a p-value, right? That's this. Um, you know, so, what is the probability that I test positive but don't have the disease, right? So that's that nine out. Of, so, out of the people that don't have the disease, nine out of them, nine out of ninety-six, 
uh, test positive and they don't have the disease. That's kind of the, the null hypothesis type approach, right? Did that make any sense to you? Because I think when I was saying it, it started making less sense. <laughs> that makes sense. I really understand the three out of the three out of uh, twelve thing. I don't really understand why you care about the nine out of ninety six, but apparently that's what that's the idea is that the frequency is concerned with that. I found that section a little bit like I, maybe I'm just too too. My, my, you could tell from my quiz score. I'm like, huh? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> I'm hoping it becomes clear uh, as we go on to me though. If anyone wants to add anything to that, please feel free. Where were we? That was four or four. Okay. Okay. After stumbling through that, let's talk about the history of this. So one of the things that's, that's interesting is why now is Bayesian becoming so popular? Like Ryan was saying, well, I guess I better learn this stuff because uh, everybody's it's become very popular and all of these tools are coming out. Um, and the book says there's basically three reasons for this. The first, and I think the most important is this advances in computing. These techniques and ideas have been around since, you know, Bayes himself and people have kind of understood how to think about experiments this way, but it was basically prohibitive to do it for any real important case. You can do at least, we'll, I get, we'll see in like the next chapter maybe that I think, or in a future chapter, I see ahead that we're going to talk about conjugate families and all that. And that's kind of an analytical Bayesian in some ways where you don't have to do some kind of numerical techniques, but most situations require these numerical techniques in order to get answers out. And for a long time, that was just, you know, you, know, you do Monte Carlo markup chain. That sounds super complicated. How can I do that on my personal computer? But you can now. It's actually relatively straightforward and pretty amazing that you can do that. So that's kind of the first, re I mean, part of the reason for frequencies one way to look at frequencies, to my view, is it's kind of an approximation of, of you can you can derive the frequencies methods from a Bayesian framework under a certain set of assumptions. You know, certain set of assumptions of prior, certain set, certain approximations, whatever you can come back out and get the frequencies type things out. And the nice thing about frequencies stuff, a lot of these things are making a lot of simplifying assumptions. You know, about Gaussian distributions or whatever, and then this all stuff it just becomes like a table lookup or something, and it's relatively straightforward to apply to your data without having to have a large part of large computing power. And that's one of the reasons why frequentists, I think, hang on so long. Let's see, the other thing is the departure from tradition. I guess he's saying that people are just, you know, no, like for you were saying yourself, some, some of you were saying yourself that when you went to school, you learned P values and you learned hypothesis testing and you learned the, that standard thing. But people are starting now to mainly because I would say, because the internet, that people are being exposed to much more diverse methods of looking at data and not, not just what you learned in school. So this, this kind of departure from traditions happening, I think is what they're saying there, in my view. And finally, people are starting to, you know, for a long time, one of the biggest problems, I think, with Bayesian acceptance with this whole idea of subjective probability. And I think that's become less important for two reasons. One is that it's really not like that. It's not really that doesn't really show up that much in Bayesian thinking as you might think. A lot of times you, you collect enough data, your priors get washed away anyway. And second of all, I think is that people are realizing that even the frequentism method are subjective. There's all these hidden assumptions you just don't say how you don't say. And you really are having a, you are really thinking about your priors when you, when you analyze your data in a frequentist way. Or you're not thinking about it, you should, I guess is what I mean to say. So I think, hey, look, we're doing good on time. I'm going really fast probably. Um, so what are we doing ahead of time here? We are doing uh, four units. The first one is going to be the foundations. Uh, this is going to be you know, what Bayesian modeling really is and some examples of it doing this conjugate analysis, as they call it. The first one you can see in the tech table of consciousness is beta binomial, which is estimating the probability of a uh, um, from measurements, like you flip a you know, flip a coin and measure how many heads there are. What's, what do you know? What do you think about the probability distribution of the, the of the heads versus tails on that coin? Is it a weighted coin? That type of thing. And so this is very like baby steps into it, which I, but I think it's great because it really lays the foundations and makes you understand the basics really well. Uh, then they go, okay, well you can't do conjugate families. Then we're going to bring in Monte Carlo Markov chain, and this is a numerical method for finding out the posterior distribution of your um, model, which is very widely used. 
So that so and then that's the third unit is when you really get into the the meat of things, the regression. Up until then, you're just looking at probability distributions and trying to estimate probability distributions based on measurements. Now we're going to regress, do regression, do you know curve, basically line fitting or whatever, or you know calculate the probability, um, calculate the probability as a function of some parameter, for example, or calculate some other numerical thing as a function of some parameter. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with regression, but this is the Bayesian approach to regression. And then the last section is on this hierarchical Bayesian models, which um, I'm not very familiar with myself. The idea is you have grouped data and the groups have some things in common, and this is a way of handling that without, you know, now they're not independent anymore. They actually have some, some, uh, some interdependence between these groups, and you're going to do this, you're basically going to fit them all at the same time uh, with these with this hierarchical method. And that's about the extent of my knowledge. So I'll learn it when you learn it when we get there, but that's basically what it is <laughs> um, on that. Anyone have any comments? I was just going to say the, the last one is probably the thing I'm most interested in. I work in a preference, like a utility preference group where we ask people to rate different attributes and make choices. And, and so the hierarchical Bayes models are common in terms of um, I don't, I mean, I'm still learning about it, but it's, it's a common way to kind of look at um, sort of utility issues with uh, people's preferences. So that would be really important. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I look forward to, I look forward to getting to that section because I've heard some things, good things about it. Like it does some kind of automatic, like shrinkage of errors or whatever, but I don't really know how it works. So look forward to that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and I just want to comment that just because you know what the hell this conjugate means. It just means that the, the posterior distribution is kind of the same form as the prior. So it allows you to kind of just plug and play, you know, just find out immediately what the new posterior is because it's basically the same form. Uh, exercises in the book. Um, I didn't go over those. And I don't plan to. And I think we'll, at this point, we're good to go to chapter two. But you should. They're all like, um, what do you call it? subjective kind of, you know, oh, think about this or what if you did this or what kind of Twitter tweet would you do or whatever. So they don't require any, any, um, what am I trying to say? They don't require any actual analysis or just food, uh, food for thought. Did anyone look at those at all? I have not. I, I literally just got the book in the mail yesterday. It took forever. So I, I, I didn't realize it was online. The book. Yeah, the link to the book is also in the Slack channel. I also picked up a copy too um, because you know they hey they gave a discount. I can resist. <laughs> <laughs> it's on sale, but um, I think the discount's still uh, available. So I guess what we could do is if anyone has you know go you feel free to use the Slack channel in between times. I, you know, and start like a thread on any of these that are particularly interesting or you find confusing or have questions about. I looked through them and it seemed pretty straightforward to me. I guess the only one I didn't think was straightforward was 1.6. Um, they ask for, they say, oh, there's several data scientists openings at a much ballyhooed company named Oracle. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I kid. Uh, much ballyhooed company. Have you read their the job description? You know for a fact that you are qualified for the position. This is your data. Your goal is to ascertain whether you will actually be offered a position. That is your hypothesis, right? That's what they say. And then they say, from the perspective of someone using frequentist thinking, what question is answered? What question is answered in testing the hypothesis that you will be offered the position? I'm like, I don't really, I don't quite get that. Like, what are they? Do you know what they're going for there? Anyone have any idea? Like, so wait, having read the job description, you have for a fact that you call. So oh, like after like many like many times of you applying to the job like in the long run, like if you were to apply to the job, you know, let's say ten, a hundred, a thousand, right, times, like how many of those times would you get accepted? Which is like a really bizarre interpretation because I just apply once and I either, you know, am offered the job or I'm not. Yeah. Whereas, like, I feel like with oh, the Bayesian, that's what they're going for. Yeah, because I feel like it, right, the Bayesian way would just be like, what is the probability 
I get this job offer given that I'm qualified, right? That's like how I think you would frame it. Right. Um, but I think claim right. the frequentist way would just be they're more concerned about uh, like uh, over many <laughs> different, I guess, types of trials, <laughs> how many of those would result in you um, being offered the job. Oh, okay. So we, I, now I think I actually understand. I think what the answer to A might be, what question is answered? None. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you only have one data point. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas from the perspective of Bayesian, you can say, oh, well, you can actually think maybe the probability was more likely than what you might have thought it was ahead of time or something, right? Yeah. You can make an adjustment to your probability based on that one data point. Maybe that's what they mean. I don't know. I'm not quite sure, but I just wanted to point that out. And if anyone has any more thoughts on it, feel, feel free to jump in there. Yeah. So I think that's all I really plan to cover. Is there anything else? Anyone want to offer anything else up about the book? Where was I just there in the book? Just real quick before we forget. So next week or an hour earlier, uh, it sounds like is our start time. Correct. Uh, um, so there's slides from previous cohorts. There's, am I, I'm not supposed to do anything with the, the book, the wiki book, right? I mean, or I can use that as a way to guide my discussion leading is there anything i should know before as i oh, prepare yeah so if you you mean the share the, you're talking about this this shared notes thing you can just use this yeah you definitely can just use well come on load up there you go you can definitely use this as it is um if you want to make changes to it you certainly can you can go to the github um, okay. and and there's instructions there on how to do that. I'm trying to find the okay. thing uh, here. So GitHub repo on the on the thing. That's actually the the source code to the to the same thing you're looking at. Here's all the mark. It's our markdown files, right? Yeah. So there's instructions like how to present, and uh, you set up GitHub locally, blah blah blah. Uh, use and basically you're gonna use use this to pull. Use this will actually create a separate. We'll do a bunch of things. A fork. Oh, no, actually, I'm sorry. Do this use this create from GitHub will create a fork of the repository and um, pull it down into a directory on your computer that you can then mess around with. And you can edit that, present from that on your computer. That's what I did because I didn't push these changes up to um, up to the repo yet. Anyway, those these are the instructions. I only done like twice. So if you if you want to mess with it, uh, feel free to ask me. But also, John the Geek is the real expert on this. He's the one that made all this stuff happen so if you want to make changes if you don't you don't have to make changes if you want to use it as is that's fine too you can present any way you want to actually you don't even have to use this you can make a powerpoint show size you want to or you can it's up to you completely it's easier it's better in some ways if you use if you use the mark book mark uh the r markdown book because then you can share it with the next cohort that might come along they'll use whatever changes right. you made i don't know what your experience is with git and all that so i've kind of it's uh, a hit or miss. I, I, I go through stretches where I don't really use it, and I, you know, so this is probably good practice for me. So, okay, well, good. Yeah, don't worry because you can't screw it up. <laughs> right. Because John won't let you. John's the he does the pull request, so he he's, he's the one that won't, he won't he won't bring in broken stuff. So, I, I found that if you just download, if you only work on the one chapter, and then you just knit that one chapter to make sure it all looks good, um, and then you can push that and you don't have to build the whole book. Just build, you know, John says build the whole book, but I don't do it. I just build the chapter I was working on and it seems to be fine, right? The, the changes are all local, so it's, it's all good. Unless you're gonna do things like add a bunch of packages and stuff like that. Which, you know, I, I hope we don't need to do that. I know that the previous cohort, the leader that added this, um, added the uh, the diagram, diagramming thing, so you can make that chart. Where is it? I lost my. Um, this kind of chart, this di actually the code right here, diagram, diagrammer. So he made that diagram using that um, library. So you can add libraries is what I'm saying, but that, once you do that, you're onto another level of, uh, <laughs> of manipulating that source code. Yeah. Uh, Ron, cool. you said Any you might questions? you might be doing them. So like at my current job, I use 
pretty much just Python. Um, there's not really a ton of R users, but you said you might be using Python for the exercises. Yeah, for myself, because okay. I think that um, my R experience is super rusty. I don't know how well that's going to work, but I, I thought it would be good because the problem is I actually have been using R for some other things just to learn it. Now I'm like, I opened up my, this morning I was trying to do some analysis of the money supply and I'm like, you know, looking at inflation and I, uh, <laughs> I started a Jupyter notebook and I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing? <laughs> it's been long, it's been like a month since I opened up Python. I'm like, yeah. I suddenly can't remember what to have. <laughs> so I'm like, this is bad. I better start doing some more Python right Yeah. Now. So I'm thinking, like, I guess cool. I maybe started an R and then maybe like just for my own self, because if I end up applying anything I learned at work, it will have to be in Python. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll just... I don't know how hard that's going to be or how plausible it's going to be because there's a bunch of data sets and things, but if you have yeah. RStudio, you certainly can just convert them. Oh, yeah, there. yeah. Actually, what, you know, RStudio actually will do Python right in RStudio too. Yep. There's like some kind of interoperability too, so that's kind of nice. Yeah, there's. I know what uh, reticulates. Um, but yeah, that's no, I, is, I, yeah. I, I thought I'd just ask because... Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let me see here. All right. Well, that's kind of chapter one. Um, I think hopefully that was helpful to people to kind of, you know, give me my thoughts on chapter one. I, basically, the broad strokes, I'd say this is just a quick introduction to what Bayesian thinking is, in my view. I really don't think it's that important to, like, modify your worldview to be like, oh, I'm going to start thinking a different way. Um, I think we'll see as we go on to the next chapters, this, this doesn't really become that relevant. It's just, <laughs> it's more important. Like, this is a method, a tool for logically thinking about data analysis. That's the way I like to think about it. That's my kind of view on it. And anyway, I guess that's it. I appreciate everyone. Unless anyone has yeah. any more comments or concerns or questions, um, thanks for joining. And hopefully your first book club experience with me is not gonna be a, a dissuade you from other book club experiences. This is my, again, this is my first time facilitating and only my second time presenting uh, for a book club. I've learned things both times so far. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, it'll get smoother as we go along. There's a few places that there I'm like, oh, wait a minute, what are they gonna say about this? I have no idea. Especially about so the how long is like the discussion? Should I be leading the discussion for like 30, 40? I mean, what's what's the sort of is there like any I don't know, thoughts about that? Like, does it matter? The whole thing should be, I it might be the whole thing should be kind Power. of discussion. It should be, yeah, the whole thing should be discussion in between. So if you have extra time at the end to, to like add more discussion like we're doing right now, that's always great. But at the um, you should just that's my view. The few that I've been in, that's how it's been. Like people just interrupt and like, oh, okay. Or even like the facilities, yeah, this part, I didn't really understand what they were doing. What's going on here? And then the other people, oh, I think what's going on is this and that kind of thing. And those are the best discussions too. So so don't worry too much about that. But yeah, it should just, you can use the whole hour up. Um, if you feel that, if you feel it, because I haven't, I don't do a lot to chapter two. Um, if you feel it needs to be broken up and you think, oh, I've done, I think I've prepared, or we get to the end of the hour and you're like, well, there's still more to do. Uh, we can just move the schedule yeah. down and make room. So yeah, I was thinking that it is. That's a pretty deep one. That's a pretty deep chapter. So yeah, I'll do what I can. That should... Yeah. So don't worry if you feel like we need to split up. That that's totally up to us. It's our thing. All right, guys, we're running out of time. So I will see you next time. Thanks yeah, for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much. Good to meet you guys. Bye. Yep. Good to meet you guys too.